Hello, this is Ryan Ellis, and I am pleased, honored, and full of joy to be joined by, with the Larupin legendary Lee Kennedy. How you doing today, sir? Ryan, Ryan, how you doing, man? Hi. Uh, I'm doing swell. Uh, last week when we talked, you said that you had a friend that was closer than a brother to you. That, you know, one of your nearest, dearest friends, you had such love between you two, like David and Jonathan, uh, a man went by the name Paul Humphrey. Yeah, Paul Humphrey, right. And, and I, I, you know, you spoke so glowingly of him. You've spoken about him before. I went online and looked up his Wikipedia article. You go online right now, at least, it's very, very sparse. I mean, it's got an extensive discography, but as far as the man himself, doesn't have a lot to say. So... I thought maybe you could fill in a couple of blanks and, you know, maybe repeat yourself if you have to, but just talk about Paul Humphrey for a little bit. Well, Paul Humphrey was always a side man. And back in the day, the side man didn't get the credit that he's due. Very few did, you know, like, so I, well, I believe he wasn't a side man. I believe he was the man in the drama. But I'm saying, like, um, Paul, he did a thing called Kool-Aid on his own. But he was a talented drummer. He wrote a book. I think he wrote the first drum book or something like that. Like how to play the drums, like a studio. Right, right. I think he wrote the very like on first jazz one. Drumming or, yeah. And he played with some of everybody, Nancy Wilson, Lou Rawls, you name them. Like, I don't think he's on anything live with Lou Rawls that they're recording. That could have been to do this fact that the contract with the different company. Paul was contracted with, uh, had a contract. I don't remember. Let's see. But he had a record out called Kool Aid was on his own. Now he did some things, but he um, sold his. Hey, how you guys doing? He sold everything to to Japan. Yeah. They sold everything to Japan. All this record come out is on Japan label. So, so he didn't do too much um, on his own as a as a, a leader. Yeah. And, but he was the first black to play with Lawrence Welk. Man. He played for Long, Lawrence Welk for years. And his daughter named Pierre, uh, she danced on New Year's, I think it was New Year's night. I have a picture of it, I'll say. She was about seven, eight years old. She tap danced. On Lawrence Welk's show. On Lawrence Welk's show. Wow. And that was unheard of at the time. Yeah. In fact, Paul was the only black that ever played with him that I know of. He, he was a regular band, he was on a black band leader. Not just the first, the only. As a, wow. As a member of the group. Yeah. Right, Lawrence Welk. Yeah, and, and him and his champagne music, uh, Lawrence Welk, he was around for a long time, so to be the only, and to be around from like, what, the 1920s, and I think he stopped, he, he hung up his hat around the 80s or 90s. I mean, what, what a run, and, and what an honor to be the only one in that run. Uh, well, Paul, Paul um, he started getting ill, I forget what year it was, but uh, he just passed away. 2014 he died, it said, uh -huh. on, on the internet. Yeah, like uh, last time he came in town, because I was living in his house, and he came by, surprised, and he was in, coming through, and he had a rent of the car, and he came by the, the house there. And that's the last time that I saw him at night. Man. Yeah. But he played with Samuel Davis Jr., he played with their... You name all the old people, singers, uh, uh, band leaders, he played in the band when he, he was out there. Um, so this, this sounds like a, you've said before he was, as a, as a man, he was very generous. As an artist, clearly all the best, all the best played with him. So he was the best artist, the best man. I mean, what else was he the best at? I don't know, but he and I was like family. We got close like that. His mother, I would go visit her. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I went to visit her once and she was ill and nobody knew it. And uh, she was hallucinating or whatever. Wow. And so I had to, I got Paul and came and picked her up and moved to California, out in California. So. You treat her like a mother, pretty much. Just right. like he's like a brother, I would go she's by like and a mother. check on her. And then Damn. every Saturday, she would come downtown and she'd go to Crowley's. Yeah. Bought, Paul bought her a, a brand new Cadillac. It was a 59 Coup de Ville, and it had only been to Toledo, first it had been out of town. Man. 
and she only drive it on a Saturday and Sunday. She drive it downtown every Saturday because she goes to Crowley's yeah. across the street from my store. And uh, on a Sunday, she drives to church, and then she don't drive it no more. And so I forget what year it gave, gave it to me, but it only had 59,000 miles. Oh. just got broken into it. I drove it for you. <laughs> yeah, he was nice to me. And, uh, you want to go up the ramp or... or, or? Want to go up the ramp or go through this way? Up to you. This go way. this way. All right, Lee's leading the way. <laughs> and so um, she would make hats. She did made a lot of hats and um, sold them. Like straw hats or dress hats? Dress hats. People. Like out, out of felt or yeah. I don't know what they were. They were in the church, you know. Black yeah. people wore a lot of hats back in the day, especially the church. Bonnies or whatever, she'd make all kind of hats. She had a machine, she had did all that. So Creative and, family. Yeah. Paul and I was real tight. And so he, he came and stayed with me. When he came in town, after, I, uh, after his mother, he stayed with me for a couple of weeks at my house. You know? uh-huh. So we was very close. All right. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you some more about Paul Humphrey in, in a second, but thank you very much for just that much now. Okay, thank you.